Hello everyone, this is Michael. I'm on my rock and roll soapbox and today we're going to talk about one of my favorite bands, Dream Theater. Dream Theater, of course, is arguably the most popular, successful, and perhaps influential progressive metal band of the last 30 years. And they've been an ongoing entity since their origin in the late 80s, meaning that for the last 35 years, Dream Theater has had a prominent place in the progressive metal, progressive scene. Today, we're going to do a very deep dive into their very comprehensive um, library. Uh, Dream Theater has 15 full-length albums that we're going to look at and give rankings to. In addition to that, they have eight full-length live albums. And when I say full-length, I mean that because most of them are entire concerts, which last anywhere from two and a half to three hours. They also have a fairly substantial catalog of live DVDs, which I'm a big fan of, so we're going to look at those as well. And when we add it all up, we find that we have nearly a hundred hours of dream theater music. In fact, out of my entire library of music, I own more music by dream theater than any other band. I would be lying if I didn't say that they're one of my favorite bands of all time. Uh, like I say, dream theater started in the late eighties. The, the five members of the band initially were Mike Portnoy on drums, uh, John Petrucci on guitar, John Myung on bass. The vocalist was Charlie Dominici and the keyboard player was Kevin Moore. Uh, within a couple years, two of those members would have moved on, but for their first album, which came out in 1989, entitled When Dream and Day Unite, those were the five that, that made that album. Uh, in many ways, when Dream and Day Unite is their least known album. It's almost proto Dream Theater. The uh, album suffers from two things that, that hold its grade down a little bit. One is the uh, primitive production values. Production values in the late 80s were actually pretty good, but they weren't able to take advantage of those. This was a fairly low budget release. And uh, for that reason, the production values just are not all that great. In addition, the vocalist Charlie Dominici is not as strong as you would like for a band of this type. Dream, Dream Theater really kind of wanted to be like other metal bands of that era that had operatic uh, vocals. Bands like Queensryche with Jeff Tate and Iron Maiden with Bruce Dickinson were kind of what they were going for. And Charlie Dominici just wasn't all that strong. Now, having said that, um, as we see, the... the the ranking for this is a 68 out of 100 and if we look at our handy dandy guide here uh, 68 is not bad that's a that's a good album for the most part it's just maybe it doesn't have real high high highs or there's perhaps some songs that are not not as uh, that, that I don't like let's say um, but when we look at it by song we see that they have three really strong songs um, the first is Yitzy Jam and Yitzy Jam in many ways was the Dream Theater really saying who they're gonna be it's an instrumental and it features uh, really, you know, aggressive, virtuosic performances on all the instruments. They're really going quite crazy on it. Not as crazy as they did on some other songs, but, but it's definitely a sign of what the band would be in the future. It's my favorite song on this album. Two other songs that I really like are The Killing Hand, which is uh, perhaps Dream Theater's first epic uh, song. It's, uh, I believe, about 10 minutes long. And I would rank it among any of their, you know, 10 plus 10 minute plus songs, epic, it's really great, it gets an 80 instead of 100 because of the two things that I mentioned before, the production values and the uh, vocals are not as strong as we won't be. And then Afterlife is more like a five minute kind of typical uh, uh, rock song by, by Dream Theater and I like that a lot. And then afterwards you have some good songs, the rest are all good, they're not bad, they're just not as strong as, as some these others. And then we have one song, Status Seeker, that I'm not a big fan of. So it comes in at a two. But overall, that gives us a ranking of 68. For a band's very first effort, that is certainly acceptable. But it did not, the, the release of Wind Dream and Day Unite did not move the needle for uh, Dream Theater. It didn't bring them additional attention. They didn't get any radio airplay. It didn't break them out of their regional New York market. And in many ways, was somewhat of a failure. It's also released on, I believe it's called Mechanics Record. Let me check my notes here. 
Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, Mechanic Records, and because it wasn't successful, uh, Mechanic Records released, they, they, they cut Dream Theater after uh, the release of the album. After the release of When Dream and Day Unite failed to grow Dream Theater's fan base and, and uh, recognition, they recognized they needed to make a change, and so they decided to move on from Charlie Dominici and bring in a different vocalist. However, the, the getting rid of Charlie Dominici was the easy part. It, finding another vocalist proved to be quite difficult, and it took them a good two years before they finally uh, decided to hire James Labrie, the Canadian vocalist, to replace Dominici. And with that, they were then able to record their second album. It was recorded in 1991 and released in the summer of 1992. The name was Images and Words. And this is a no questions asked, indisputable progressive metal classic. If you are a fan of progressive music, if you're a fan of metal music, you should know this album. Uh, if you are a fan of progressive metal and have listened to any bands that play that genre of music in the last 20, 25, 30 years, it's almost certain that they were influenced by images and words. If you go to any metal music site, progressive metal site, progressive music site, and look at top albums, images and words will show up on the list, and the kudos are well deserved. This is uh, a genre bending album. Uh, it is no doubt a the statement that Dream Theater made of who they are and what they wanted to accomplish. The production, unlike on When Dream Day Unite, is outstanding. You can hear everything. It's brilliant. They have long songs. They have complex arrangements. They have its extensive instrumentals that allow all the musicians to uh, show off their chops. What is different than maybe some of their later stuff is I don't feel it's a self-indulgent album in any way. I feel like... Even the longer songs like, um, and let's look at our song uh, rankings here. The longer songs like Learning to Live, that's a 15 minute song I believe, and it's, it's, it deserves to be a 15 minute song. The musical ideas that are expressed warrant a 15 minute song. Uh, we can see that we've got five songs that rank uh, 100 on my list. The opener, Pull Me Under, which is about an eight minute uh, classic kind of um, epic FM radio tune from the 70s, you know, kind of like a Stairway to Heaven type song. Eight minutes, it's got different parts, it builds up, it changes. It's also the only song that really ever received any radio or MTV play for Dream Theater. Other songs that rank as 100, Take the Time, which is about a seven minute song. It has a really cool kind of uh, outro to it or ending that, that, that it's, it's an extensive ending that, that was kind of it's almost like tacked on at the end. It doesn't seem like it's part of the song, but it fits brilliantly. Metropolis Part 1. This, in many ways, is the prototype dream theater song in that um, there are lyrics, and it's got a, uh, a pretty cool arrangement, but the lyrics are relatively limited for a song that I think clocks in at nine minutes. But within <laughs> the beginning lyrics and the end lyrics, they got about a six-minute instrumental section there that uh, really is the template for what Dream Theater did with a lot of their music. And I would argue that they've kind of repeated that formula a lot over the years, but this was when it first came out. Under a Glass Moon, I love that song. The guitar solo in it is awesome. Learning to Live is a classic Dream Theater epic. Really tells a, uh, a great story. The lyrics are really solid throughout this album. Uh, Mike, per uh, John Petrucci provides a lot of them, um, but Kevin Moore, the, the keyboard player, also contributed lyrics. Um, just a, a truly, truly phenomenal album that has withstood the test of time and is a, a, a classic within the progressive metal community and really a strong effort uh, in any kind of rock and roll, um, uh, in, in, within rock and roll at all, just period. I should mention at this time that <clears throat> this is when I first got introduced to Dream Theater. I honestly do not remember how I stumbled across them or how I was introduced. I do remember that I purchased images and words on CD and at that time I was poor. CDs were expensive. I didn't own a ton. I was trying to slowly build. Had a lot of LPs from when I was younger and now I was trying to build a CD collection and somehow this became one of my earlier CDs. And while I liked the CD, it didn't convert me into a huge Dream Theater fan at the time. Uh, I did not quite 
get everything. I remember listening to long songs like Metropolis and Learning to Live and not embracing them as much as I would later in life. But it got Dream Theater on uh, the radar for me. And so now we've got two albums. We've got When Dream and Day Unite and Images and Words. Images and Words, like I said, did get some airplay on MTV and on the radio, and it certainly increased Dream Theater's uh, recognition and appreciation in the rock and roll world. They toured all over North America. I believe they toured Europe. I believe they also toured Japan on that album. And so they were really, you know, on their way as an entity. And so it was that two years later, they released their third album called Awake. And you can see that I like this album. I give it an 85, but it's not quite as good as Images and Words. A couple of reasons for that. <clears throat> One is it kind of seems like Images and Words too. They're not really treading much ground that they hadn't tread in images and words. Nothing revolutionary new or ambitious or anything. It is a darker album. It's a more metal album. It's a heavier album. Uh, it, except for the last song, I think, called Space Divest, which is kind of an atmospheric, kind of uh, moody instrumental piece from the keyboardist Kevin Moore. Um, but this is a really good album, too, and it's withstood the test of time. Many big time Dream Theater fans will put Images and Words and Awake right up there among their very best albums. You can see I got three songs that I rank as a hundred on this. Voices is one of my absolute favorite songs by Dream Theater. It's underrated in my opinion. It's one of John Petrucci's best lyrical efforts. I love the lyrics on this uh, song with all the uh, Catholic imagery. Um, it's just, I, I'll never get sick of that song. Same thing with Scarred. I think that's an underrated classic from Dream Theater. Another 10 minute epic song. Same Voices is also a 10 minute epic song. The Mirror is real heavy. Um, uh, we do have kind of their first, if you will, progressive concept hand in that the, the three songs, Voices, The Silent Man, and The Mirror are supposed to uh, form one kind of um, single uh, concept, if you will. But Awake, um, did not do as well as Images and Words. Uh, no songs on this became radio hits or got a lot of play on MTV or anything like that. And so it's a little bit of a disappointment to um, the record company. Now, I'm going to put our next one up, which is A Change of Seasons. Now, A Change of Seasons, you see I have it ranked as 100. That's for the one song on this. A Change of Seasons is not a full-length LP or full-length CD. It is what was known as an EP back in the day. And it consists of five songs. One song is the primary, A Change of Scene. It's a true, classic, progressive, 25-minute song. This is Dream Theater's first effort to try and kind of mimic what Yes did on Close to the Edge or rush on 2112 a 25-minute epic song and this does not this rating of 100 does not include the four other songs on that album which are the uh live covers of different songs this is only the studio work it's not a full-length cd it's just the a change of season song but i included it here because for me this is the most important song in their catalog why because this is when I really got into Dream Theater. I found this CD at a bargain bin, uh, I believe at Walmart. Uh, I had not bought Awake. I'd kind of forgotten about Dream Theater after Images and Words. And I bought it because of the cover songs. I wanted to hear them do all the cover songs. But the, from the first time I listened to the song, A Change of Seasons, I was invested. I, I, to this day, I think it's the very best song by Dream Theater in their entire catalog. It's among my 10 favorite songs by anybody of all time. It's what we're listening to right now. I could listen to it forever. It, it, it's, it's just an outstanding piece. And uh, it, it, for me, all of a sudden it put Dream Theater in a different light. Before, I kind of knew about them and forgotten about them. But with this, I was, I went Based on this, I went back and bought Awake. And, oh, that's pretty good. And so now you've got Images and Words, Awake, and A Change of Seasons. 
and I am in. I am now a Dream Theater fan, and I'm ready to get what's next. So A Change of Seasons for me is absolutely phenomenal. I uh, cannot say anything bad about that song. Now then, as I mentioned, the, the, the reason the band released that is they've been playing the song A Change of Seasons in concerts, but it wasn't on any album, and their fans at this point in time you had a fairly substantial fan community online which was new in the mid 90s to have an online community of fans and the fans were really pressuring the band to release the song uh, so that they could he hear a studio version of it and so they used this as kind of a bridge between Awake and their next real full length CD now their next full length CD was a change of pace because the the record company was disappointed with the performance of Awake and they really pushed the band to do more commercial uh, songs. They wanted shorter songs, they wanted poppier songs, they wanted something they could play on the radio. And um, Mike Portnoy wasn't a big fan of that idea but John Petrucci was. And you got uh, their 1996 release falling into, or 1997 release falling into infinity. Uh, many Dream Theater fans, especially at the time, considered this to not be a really great album. They did not like the change of direction. I personally didn't mind it that much, but you can see it's a lower grade than than their previous efforts from me. Um, but I don't mind... <coughs> I didn't really mind the change in uh, to, towards the more poppy sounding stuff, as long as the songs were good. And we can see that they have some moments here uh, Peruvian Skies, absolutely. That's about a six minute, um, you know, it's a classic prog rock song, uh, prog metal song, if you will. Um, Lines in the Sand, a 10 minute epic that I will put up there with any other 10 minute epic by Dream Theater. Absolutely brilliant, especially in the kind of middle part where they slow it down and there's this very tasteful John Petrucci guitar solo. Um, this is somewhat of a device valve. Now, I think that when it first came out, hardcore Dream Theater fans were not particularly enthused about it. And for a long time, it was kind of the redheaded stepsister of the band's catalog outside of When Dream and Day Unite. I think over time, however, it's gained uh, appreciation among fans as still a, a, a quality album. Uh, however, it also did not sell particularly well and uh, the the record company kind of backed off and uh, stopped telling the the band what to do and so for their next album they decided they were going to do a concept album which if you're a real prog rock band you have to have a concept album at some point you got to be like you know Genesis Lamb Lies Down on High on the Lamb Lies Down on Broadway or Pink Floyd the Wall or Rush 2112 you know Queensryche Operation Mindkind all great progressive bands have uh, the, the album long concept and that's what Dream Theater decided to do and it was interesting it was basically a continuation of the song Metropolis Part 1 from Images and Words and they decided but that's only a 10 minute song so their next album was going to be part two, and it is known as Scenes from Memory. It came out in 1999. I bought this the day that it came out, and I can tell you from the first second I listened to it, I loved it. Everything about it. The, the spoken word intro where the guy sounds like he's uh, being hypnotized. Uh, the way the songs segue from one to another. The, the different characters that are involved, the discovery, uh, everything. This is just truly, truly outstanding album from beginning to end. And you can see that I love every single song. The only thing I threw her eyes, I rate is it just an 80 uh, rather than a 100 song, uh, which is a 4 out of 5 as opposed to a 5 out of 5. But this is a classic, classic rock and roll album, prog metal progressive, hard rock, you name it, this is a truly, truly outstanding album. And in my opinion, it is the uh, uh, apex of Dream Theater's career. And 
like I say, I bought this the day that it came out. I was already a fan, but this just made this is what turned me into a huge Dream Theater fan. And I listened to this album or CD over and over and over again back in 1999. And um, it did not. At this point, Dream Theater's career is kind of in a holding stage. They 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 broken out with images and words, awake and um, falling into infinity had not moved the needle, but scenes from memory did. It got it didn't get airplay, but among hardcore the hardcore fan base was growing now. Essentially, you had people that were embracing them as a touring band and as a LP or CD producing band. Um, they hadn't broken out to where they're playing large arenas or stadiums or anything like that, but they were definitely getting more attention. They were getting mentioned on lots of lists, getting a lot of a lot of kudos. They were well deserved, and uh, this was just a, for me one of my favorite albums of all time. Just 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 absolutely brilliant. I'd forgotten to mention that uh, after after the recording of Awake. The keyboardist Kevin Moore had decided he didn't want to be in the band anymore and he left and he was replaced by uh, Derek Sherinian. Sherinian only lasted one album, which is too bad because I liked him a lot, but he was replaced uh, for Scenes from a Memory by Jordan Rudis for the keyboard player. So by Scenes from a Memory we now have Mike Portnoy on drums, John Pertucci on guitar, John Young on bass, James Labrie on vocals, and Jordan Rudis on keyboards. And that is really the classic Dream Theater lineup. They would be the band that stayed together for the next 12 years and record uh, everything in, during that time period. Um, I personally like Derek Sherinian a little better. Uh, he's not as uh, perhaps skilled as Jordan Rudis on keyboards, but I thought he brought an element that I liked a lot. And I, I Between Petrucci and Portnoy, you already got two musicians that can play more notes than, than you can listen to in a second. Rudis can do the same, and sometimes I think the three of them got into self-indulgent uh, efforts that, from this point forward, I think plague a lot of their, their efforts. Anyway, Scenes from a Memory, absolutely brilliant. Now this is where my opinions are probably going to start to deviate from a lot of hardcore uh, Dream Theater fans. So I was just as big a Dream Theater fan at this point as, as you could be and I was really looking forward to the next release which was Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence and this was a double CD release so I thought great you had a full length concept album before now you got a double CD and you can see I have not a great score for it I only have a 69 now I will say my score differs from many other people on this a lot of hardcore Dream Theater fans think this is their best best album I don't, and here's why. If we look at the songs, um, the first five songs make up side the, the first CD, and I don't rate any of them higher than a three out of five, which is a 60, and I have misunderstood as only a 40, which is a two out of five. Every single one of these songs suffer from being too long. I said earlier that on Images and Words, you had I called it a 15 minute song, I, I looked, it's only 11 and a half minutes, but Learning to Live is a lengthy song, it's 11 and a half minutes song, long. It's that long because the music ideas needed to be, needed 11 and a half minutes to be expressed. There's nothing being forced there. Here, I think they're going for long songs to be long songs. Uh, I don't think the music ideas behind these warrant the length of them. The Glass Prison is, I think, 13 minutes. It's notable in that it's the first part of Mike Portnoy's documenting his 12 steps to recovery uh, from alcoholism. And these are capturing the first two steps, the glass prison representing a, a liquor bottle that he's a prisoner of. It's too long. It just goes on too long. Misunderstood goes on too long. The great debate goes on too, every one of these songs if you were to reduce them by about 25 to 30 percent in length, I think they'd be better. I just don't think the music ideas warrant the length, and this is a problem that has plagued Dream Theater ever since. Virtually every album suffers, in my opinion, from bloat. The second thing that crops up here that I think has been a problem for Dream Theater from this point forward is 
self-indulgence. Um, like I said, Portnoy, Petrucci, and Jordan Rudis, they're... There may be musicians who are as capable of them, but there aren't any that are more capable. There's nothing other guys can do that they can't do. There probably is, but uh, I think at this point, between the three of them, they they kind of suffer from how many notes can I play in the shortest period of time. Uh, it's just that that's why my ranking for this album is lower. Now you can see for the second disc, which was really supposed to be one song, broken out into these six, seven, eight parts. Uh, I like this a lot. You can see I got the the op- overture, which is a Jordan Ruta specialty. It's it's instrumental and it's got a symphonic quality to it. Um, uh, I love it. It's great. And then throughout most of it, I buy into all these songs. They 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 cover lots of different uh, tempos and. Uh, moods, they, they got aggressive, hard and fast, they got quiet, soft and contemplative. Uh, the guitar work on um, Goodnight Kiss uh, is brilliant in my opinion, very tasteful. Uh, what I don't like are the ending parts. Uh, you, the, you, a lot of long, epic, progressive pieces have as the conclusion, the mid-tempo sing along hold your lighter up in the air uh elements to them where you you maybe had a long song and now we're getting to the the apex or the conclusion or the crescendo and it's a mid-tempo beat and uh, the ideas for the fans to sing along and hold their lighters or nowadays phones up in the air and it doesn't work for me it drums on too long and it drones It, it it does it's it just didn't work for me, so I don't like the last two parts. But I do like that song, Six Degrees of, of Innocence, of Inner Turbulence. But for those reasons, my grade is only a 69. You'll find that most other people will grade um, will grade this song higher than I do. So Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence, while not my favorite uh, Dream Theater release, certainly catapulted the band into a higher level of popularity and recognition. Uh, the, the album got a lot of attention. The hardcore Dream Theater fans embraced it, and I think that hardcore audience grew even bigger as a result of this. Um, they're playing bigger, they're playing large theaters, places like Radio City Music Hall and places like that. Um, actually, I think they didn't play Radio City Music Hall on this, this tour, but another, but they were playing larger arenas, I mean, larger theaters, headlining places um, uh, that they, they were ascended in terms of popularity and, and, and recognition uh, the five members had been together for that that had been their second release and then in 2000 I believe four we have train of thought nice the next year 2003 <clears throat> and as you can see I don't like Train of Thought as much as uh, six degrees of inner turbulence and again I think my scores here deviate from the, the general hardcore Dream Theater fan. A lot of Dream Theater fans like this album. I think this train of thought is a purposefully heavy metal album. They set out to create a heavy, heavy album, and it is that. Um, for me, it doesn't work as much. And we have a conti- several reasons why. One is at this point i think the band is really retreading ground that they've already covered quite a lot already there are not new ideas here you get some new metal kind of influences uh but uh there's just nothing really innovative or particularly creative in my opinion um every song that i hear on train of thought i feel like i've heard parts of them before or i feel like they are derivative of other dream theater songs that came out previously i also think that there's a lot of self-indulgence here um if we look at the songs uh in the name of god the closer i believe that's a 15 minute song and man it just goes on and on and has a, the the last five minutes is what i would call instrumental masturbation they're just playing their instruments as fast as they can to prove they can play them as fast as they can that's what i feel okay i know a lot of other people feel differently and you can see that there's only two really good songs that i like on this album as i am that's classic dream theater it's not 
new or innovative, but in terms of executing what they're trying to accomplish, I love uh, As I Am. I like the little kind of slow beginning and then the way it builds and then it kicks in. That's a classic Dream Theater song for me. This Dying Soul, another part of the Mike Portney re Portnoy recovery suite. Uh, I think it's about 10 minutes long, maybe goes on a little bit too long, but I like that. But after that, you can see it's pretty mediocre. Now again, my feelings about this album deviate from most Dream Theater, hardcore Dream Theater fans, I think would rate Train of Thought higher. I also think they brought in a lot of heavy metal fans at this time, folks who maybe weren't fans of prog metal, but were fans of metal. Dream, uh, Train of Thought is a really hard metal album, and I think that expanded their audience to, to a lot of metal heads at that point. Now for me, you can see at this point we've gone from scores in 77 at the lowest with a high of you know 99, and now we've had two consecutive lower scores. And and at this point I've been a fan a long time, 10 years, um, and I feel like the band is starting to kind of get into a point where they're not creating new and innovative music. So my expectations had been lowered a bit, and then two years later we get Octavarium. And you can see that it's a little bit higher for me, but not as high as the, the, the kind of earlier 90s output. And when we look at the songs, we have, you know, better distribution. I love The Root of All Evil. That's another brilliant intro. I mean, b brilliant album, CD opener. Um, kind of reminds me of As I Am from the previous album, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's a great song. I'll never tire of it. Octavarium is the 25 minute, I think 23 minute closer. And I do give them credit here because uh, they employed some new ideas. Um, they have this lengthy close, not closing, but kind of apex section where they do all this wordplay stuff. And uh, um, I give them credit for trying something new. I don't think they pull it off super well. I give this a reluctant 80. It's a, between a 60 and an 80 for me. The part of the Octavarium that I'm not super happy about is the beginning, which is a blatant ripoff of Shine On You Crazy Diamond by Pink Floyd. And it's that sort of thing where, where Dream Theater was no longer wearing their influences on their sleeves. They were, they were making really clear Okay, this is our version of Shine On You Crazy Diamond. Not the whole song, but the intro to Octavarium is so similar. You know that it's inspired by that song. The other problem I have with Octavarium is the same thing as I had with Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence. The ending is a mid-tempo, hold your... And, and it, it doesn't work. Again, it just drones on and on and on, so I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, I Walk Beside You is a four or five minute kind of dream theater rocker although this one has a lot of christianity things to it and panic attack is pretty good but beyond that you have a lot of songs that really sound like other dream theater songs and uh don't really distinguish themselves in my opinion now here our next release is 2007 and it's systematic chaos and you can see i'm i'm, I'm pretty happy with this one it's 79 there are a lot of Dream Theater fans that didn't like this album. Uh, they, they copied Pink Floyd again in that they... The, the centerpiece of the, the release is the two parts of In the Presence of Enemies. Like Pink Floyd did with Shine On You Crazy Diamond, they put the first parts at the beginning album and they put the final parts at the end of the album. So Dream Theater did it here where they have the beginning of the, the piece at the beginning of the album and the, and the end of it at the end. I like In the Presence of Enemies. Um, I prefer it better, more than Octavarium. Uh, but there are a lot of Dream Theater fans that are not fans of it. They don't like the, I don't know, there's, there's some kind of like metallic uh, sing-along stuff that uh, and all the devil, you know, um, evil, lyricisms and imagery is a turnoff to many people it works for me okay uh, outside of those songs i like forsaken which is a short uh really cool this was clearly designed to be a kind of poppy radio song and i think they pulled it off great uh constant motion 
is a Portnoy pen tune about his kind of ADD and just needing to constantly be doing things. Um, outside of that, we have, again, songs that are good. They're just not great. And they start to sound alike and sound a lot like other Dream Theater products that are songs that have come before. And at this point, I've kind of reconciled myself with the idea that Dream Theater is not ever going to be the huge... If we look at our album ratings here, we can see the peak of the career was, was right here. It was in the early 80s. I mean, in the, in the uh, 90s when they had all these great songs. And then in the last three or four albums, they've been good. They just haven't reached nearly as the same heights as they did in the 90s. And I've reconciled myself with that. A lot of bands have gone where they, they have a peak and then afterwards they're not as good. I see it all the time. And in fact, they were trending upward here. And so I kind of had modest hopes for for the next release but when it came out black clouds and silver linings was for me um, a real changing point for my relationship with the band uh, this album simply wasn't good uh, they don't have any songs that rate higher than 60 three out of five and you can see the first two-thirds of the album for me is basically bad um, every song on this album suffers from being not just too long but often way too long a Nightmare to Remember has a good song in there. There is a good song in there, but that's like a 15 minute song. It should have been about seven minutes. Um, the, the rest of the album is just mediocre. The Count of Tuscany, um, musically, Count of Tuscany is the longest song in the album. It's a 20 minute piece. It also has a blatant ripoff section in the middle where John Petrucci's, uh, he uses a volume pedal as the primary kind of tool in a what is a really tasteful guitar solo but it's clearly a ripoff from uh yes the gates of delirium from uh uh relayer album uh in that album on the gates of delirium there's a middle part and guitar Steve Howe has a very kind of moody slow volume pedal guitar solo same thing on Count of Duskany it's so clear that that it's inspired by that and again they, they, this is something that's happening with Dream Theater over and over again where they're not wearing their their um, influences on their sleeve they're kind of recreating them or, or, or imitating them it's just too too it's too clear to me um, and the songs just aren't good they're all too long they, they, they suffer from you know again instrumental masturbation in my opinion and at this point, I am really almost out on the band. Uh, this is a really low score for me. It's hard to get a 49 score. You gotta have a pretty poor album. This is easily the low point in the Dream Theater catalog for me. And at this point, I was like, huh, I'm not sure I wanna get the next album. I won't be buying it day one when it comes out. Instead, I'm gonna listen to it. Well, lo and behold, um, this was a big change in the band too because at this point Mike Portnoy had kind of grown feeling like I had that they were retreading the same ground and he asked the band for a sabbatical and wanted to essentially take five years off. He, he suggested to the band that they, they take five years off. Now I can understand the band saying five years, that's too long. Maybe three years, maybe two years, something like that. But instead... They agreed to disagree, and, and Mike Portnoy, the, the founding member, and in my opinion, the, the most influential member of the band, was out. And uh, the classic uh, lineup for Dream Theater was over. So with Mike Mangini's, uh, I'm sorry, with Mike Portnoy's departure, Dream Theater had to replace their first uh, member since 1999. And they brought in Mike Mangini to, to be the new drummer. John Myung and John Petrucci uh, knew Mike Mangini because he was a professor of music at Berkeley at the time, as well as being in a band whose name I can't remember right now. But Petrucci and Myung, along with Portnoy, had been students at Berkeley Music when they they originally. That's how they met originally, at least two of them. And um, so. There were other drummers that were considered, and there's a whole YouTube series about how they, they ended up getting choosing Mike Mangini, but it always seemed like he was gonna be the end choice because of his already familiar familiarity with the other members of the band. And so, 
in 2011, we have a dramatic turn of events, the first non-Portnoy release. And you can see it's a significant rebound from Black Clouds and Silver Linings, mostly because the songwriting is just better. And if we look at the individual songs, we can see we got quite a few that rate as high as, as 80, four out of five stars, um, and then some 60s and 140. Uh, no 100 songs. And um, one of the things that struck me when this album came out is it sounded pretty similar to Images and Words, especially the opener on the Backs of Angels, which sounds very, very similar to Pull Me Under from Images and Words. There is a theory out there that um, th th Petrucci was by far the, the, the dominant songwriter on this album. There's a theory out there that what he did is he went back to Images and Words and took the song structures and, I don't know, chord changes and things like that and basically redid them to create this album. And I don't know if that's true or not. I'll say this, I wouldn't disbelieve it. There are a number of songs on here that you can say, that sounds a lot like that song from Images and Words. But I'm not going to say that it's a fact. I don't know. And I'm not a musician and I'm not smart enough to kind of figure that out. What I do know is I like this album when it came out. It has not withstood the test of time as well as their earlier albums like when i could put on images and words right now and listen to it beginning to end not a problem i would not want to do that with this album um uh, it, it, part of it is is that it's again they're retreading ground that they've already tread quite a bit while they're doing it well there's no when i heard images and words for the first time nobody had done that kind of music before by now not only was dream theater redoing efforts that they had done before in my opinion but they have a hundred clone bands that are doing the same thing as them so there's a whole flood of music that sounds like this now dream theater isn't this one band that's unique and different from all the other bands they're part of a whole movement of of bands that sound similar so it's just it's just a reality of any band that, that when they break out as being innovative and creative and different other bands are going to copy them and then you know, you, you end up not being so unique and different. But still, it was a um, it was a, a good effort, a good rebound, and I kind of like, oh, well, th this is better. I like this. Um, recognizing that it wasn't totally, you know, great, but then they came out with the next album, and frankly, it's I'm surprised this is a, this album. Dream Theater, which came out in 2013, is a 72 because I couldn't name a single song off this album. I really couldn't. Um, and if we look at the songs, uh, we see a lot of three-star songs. The only songs that rate higher are Enigma Machine and False Awakening Suite, both instrumentals. And when your instrumentals are your best song, that's kind of an indictment that your actual songs are not all that good. And Illumination Theory, I have is an 80 here. It's probably more like a 60. Um, it's, it's the closer. I don't think it's quite 20 minutes. I think it's like 18 or so. But the final, it has a false ending where the, you think the song is over and then there's this little Jordan Rudis piano piece at the end. I don't like that. I didn't think it was done well. I thought we got rid of the fake endings in the 90s when that was a rage. Um, it just seems like this is generic dream theater at this point for me. Um, I'm not super excited about any of it. Um, there's nothing here that hadn't been done before and I'm buying the CDs now almost because I'm just a collector and I'm like well I'll give it a chance uh, so then two years later we get the astonishing okay and you can see I give this only a 55 so I'm not a fan I would give the band credit for this this is them trying something new and different this is not them recreating images and words or regurgitating ideas that they've already had before this was a bold and ambitious effort so i give them credit for that the astonishing is arguably the most bloated music piece in rock history i believe it chimes in at about 138 minutes which is two hours and 20 minutes almost two hours and 20 minutes long if anybody has ever listened to this entire thing from beginning to end um they've got more endurance than I do um, if we look at this individually we can see that it starts out not too bad I like the opener again an instrumental the, the, this the, the instrumentals are still good they're still good a lot of mediocrity in between there got some bad moments 
Disc two opens strong again. We I like it. We got three four star eighty strong song. But man, the final like 30, 40 minutes of this album is just it just drags on and on. There are a lot of ballady type songs here with um, Jordan Rudis piano bits, uh, and for me they just don't work. But the real problem I have with this album is the lyrics are just embarrassingly bad. They sound like a teenager trying to do his first effort. Um, the idea, this is a concept album, obviously. The idea behind it is that <clears throat> music is no longer enjoyed by people. They don't give any reason for why that has happened beyond people just don't seem to have the time anymore. That's that's the reason. Despite two hours and 20 minutes and um, enough lyrics to fill, you know, probably 25 pages, uh, they, they don't tell a very compelling or interesting story in my opinion. The characters are lame. Uh, um, Lord Nefarious, you know, he's the, he's the antagonist really, Lord Nefarious. We have a character named Faith, who is one of the protagonists. Um, it's just, it's so cringe to me. I, I, I really wanted to like it, and I tried. But for me, this was pretty much the final straw. And at this point, I kind of gave up on the band, I'll admit, and was not all that super interested in what they were doing. Now, of course, I can't help myself. So when Distance Over Time came out, I didn't buy it immediately, but at some point, I did, and it's okay, you know, it comes into the 68, the same grade that when Dream and Day Unite came in. Um, it's just generic Dream Theater. Again, I couldn't name one song on it, and there's not a lot of songs on there that I'm going to be playing hundreds of times over and over again. Now, since then, they've come out with a, another album. I can't remember the name of it right now. Uh, I listened to it a bit uh, on... Um, various music streaming services that I use occasionally uh, it just sounds like generic dream theater like all the love stuff for the last 10 or 12 years has sounded um, so there you go these are my rankings of the entire dream theater studio catalog outside of their most recent release uh, if we layer in oh these are the songs from from distance over time you can see a lot of third three out of fives and we got a couple that are higher than that I do like at wit's end and season or S2N I guess um, Fall Into Light 2 Th those are all three good songs after that a lot of mediocrity so these are my rankings if we layer if, if you're not familiar with the websites Progressive Archives or Metal Music Archives I encourage you to um, get familiar with them I'm going to lay th these are crowdsourced um, aggregators where rankings are based on the aggregate score of all the the users that contribute to the website progressive archives in particular is just a huge favorite of mine and if we layer in the aggregate scores from those sites we can see that my scores are not too far off what what most people think i'm higher on images and words and uh scenes from a memory than the crowd but you can see the crowd thinks they're pretty damn good too as well it's hard for a crowdsource score to reach like a hundred because there's going to be people that don't think it's perfect um my feelings on filing into infinity are a little higher than the group and then we have the two where i'm both significantly below what the crowd thinks and then the other one is black clouds and silver lining i'm way below what the crowd thinks and same thing with astonishing but you can see that over time the crowd is getting to like this is a like about a 68 i think from progressive archives so they're not huge fans of the astonishing either they did like now then let's layer in metal music archives which is a similar site but it's focused on on metal and you can see the scores are very similar to what the prog archives uh, audience thinks they are higher on the later dream theater especially the harder stuff like um uh, train of thought not surprising to me that the prog crowd is not as big a fan as the metal crowd. I'm also not surprised to see that the metal audience did not like The Astonishing, which is, you know, big concept album, and like I said, a lot of piano, ballad -y type stuff. So you can see that in general, my scores are not too crazy from, from the, uh, the, the, the crowd, if you will, though there are points where we deviate a little bit.
Now, for most bands, once you've covered their studio output, that's pretty much all you need to know. Um, every band does tend to have live albums and maybe live DVDs. But if you go to most modern rock shows today, the, the, the bands will play basically a, a playlist of their greatest hits. Dream Theater is not like that. They're more like a throwback to 70s where they don't just play their songs straight through. They will add lengthy solos. They'll um, play odd songs that you would not expect to hear, really deep cuts. And so uh, their live albums and live DVDs have a lot of tremendously great content that is distinct and different from what you get on their studio albums. So let's take a look at this. The first thing we're gonna look at is the live DVDs. I'm a huge live DVD guy. I have taken all my live DVDs and imported them and made essentially a video jukebox. And I have a lot of Dream Theater live video. You can see here there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 11 full length DVDs. So let's mention what these are and why they're important. We'll notice first that we've got several that are colored pink. That's because these are not really official releases. They were released through what used to be known as Yitzy Jam Records and uh, essentially are considered official bootlegs. Um, so note that and some of these others may not be available anymore either uh, although through eBay and secondary markets I'm sure you can find them but what's kind of amazing here is we've got uh, concerts back to 1993 and so what's cool about this is in its entire all these videos in their entirety you can see the band evolve from the early 90s when they're young and trying to prove themselves to the late 90s when they're ascendant and they're at the top of their game and playing their most critically acclaimed music and then throughout the 21st century where you know they they're now playing bigger halls uh the then the transition from portnoy to mike mangini um it's 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 pretty neat that that you can have uh, such a wide library of video live video for a band who's really outstanding when they play live and if you haven't seen a dream theater show or unaware uh they're spectacle in that they're gonna be two and a half maybe three hours long um they've grown to where the the presentation is fairly uh it's not a taylor swift show okay you're not gonna have that kind of presentation but it's pretty it's pretty advanced with you know video screens and and advanced lighting and all that kind of stuff um let's go through these and why any one is notable live in tokyo is the early days you have kevin moore still uh playing on keyboards um this is not an entire concert it's it's i think it's about 10 songs or so um Five Years in a Lifetime is a collection of videos from all kinds of different shows from the late 80s. Uh, most notably from this collection is uh, they have a number of songs from a legendary show they did at Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club in London where a number of guest performers played with them including Steve Howe from Yes and Steve Hogarth from Marillion and they did cover songs of different bands with those guys. Um, they also have um, some more intimate settings and they play some songs that don't show up on any of their albums. That's one of the things that Dream Theater does do in their shows. They'll play songs that were not on any of their albums. And so uh, on the uh, Five Years in a Lifetime you get a lot of different kinds of things like that which is pretty cool now with live scenes from New York um, you get a full presentation of scenes from a memory which if you remember from my album rankings is my favorite album by them and it's a classic album so to have that entire album uh, in presented live in a fairly ambitious presentation they had choral singers in the background they had actors uh, they, you know, the show lends itself to kind of a theatrical presentation, and they kind of leaned into that. Now, to be fair, it, it, this isn't a huge budget 
type show. They were still playing relatively small clubs at that time. But in terms of the content, this is an outstanding live DVD. You also get a, an entire full version of A Change of Seasons and Learning to Live and the <clears throat> Suite from Awake with Voices and uh, The Silent Man, and I can't remember the other song that's a part of that. So, uh, really good 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 DVD it's not the entire show this was a, another legendary show that uh, was more than three hours long and at the time was one of their biggest shows you had a lot of people that flew in from all over the world to see it <clears throat> and you don't get every song on the DVD which is a little disappointing moving forward you generally have complete shows so uh, live at Budokan is on the um, train of thought tour and you get the entire show and this is really well shot uh, very well produced my issue, you know, you can see I rank all of these high, and that's a reflection of the fact that Dream Theater always puts on great shows. They are always professional. They can play their music seemingly backwards and forwards with their eyes closed. Um, James Labrie's vocals sometimes not always as strong or consistent as you, as you would hope, um, but overall, very professional band. Every show is really impressive. Um, one of the things I really, there's two things that I really like on uh, this particular DVD is one is they play about a 15 minute uh, song that they call Instra Medley. Not instrumentally, but Instra Medley. It's a medley of the instrumental parts of some of their most legendary songs. And when you link all that together, that's super cool. And it's really effective. They also took uh, one of the songs from Scenes from a Memory, um, Beyond This Life, which is a 10 minute song unto itself, but they stretch it out to a 20 minute song and they have a lengthy jam that features a really, really neat call and response thing between Jordan Rudis and Mike Portnoy, where Portnoy's playing the drums and then Jordan Rudis responds on the keyboards and then vice versa. Uh, that kind of stuff is all over these shows and I really like it a lot. I also remember there's a lengthy guitar, intro by John Petrucci to uh, the song Trial of Tears from Falling Into Infinity. So really, really cool. Now we have uh, When Dream and Day Reunite. This is essentially, this was recorded on the 15th anniversary of the release of the album and they play the album in its entirety. And, and now you have James Labrie singing instead of Charlie Dominici and honestly, the songs on this DVD sound better than the songs do on the studio recording of the album. It also has two songs at the end where they brought back both Charlie Dominici and Derek Serenian to join the band. So at that point they had all seven members of the, that had ever been a part of the band. So pretty cool. It's not a full show, but it's very, very good. Uh, it's my favorite versions of the songs from When Dream and Day Unite. Then you have a covers DVD, which is Dark Side of the Moon. Dream Theater did this for a while where if they did two city, if they performed two shows in a city, two nights in a city, the second night they would uh, cover one of their favorite uh, albums. So they have a, a cover of Dark Side of the Moon here. They also covered um, Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast as well as Metallica's Master of Puppets and Deep Purple's Live in Japan. So at various shows they covered those here, you get the, the version of Dark Side of the Moon. Frankly, if I want to hear Dark Side of the Moon, I'd rather listen to Pink Floyd play it. Dream Theater playing, it's okay to do what cover here and there, but an entire album is a bit much. Uh, they do throw in quite a bit of bonus content where they're covering other Pink Floyd songs. Then you get another um, official bootleg, which is their show in Santiago, Chile which was also on the Train of Thought tour. Um, it's not as high quality as the Budokan uh, uh, DVD. It is kind of cool. This, I think that when they played this show, it was the largest audience they'd ever played to, and I think it was 25,000, 35,000, something like that. Um, and anybody who's seen shows from South America knows that the audience is just insane, and they are. And um, uh, and it, you know, you can see I like it. Good version. Then you have Score, which is the 20th anniversary show that they performed at Radio City Music Hall in New York in 2006. High quality DVD, complete show, almost three hours long. I think about two and a half hours long. The second half of the show features a full 
orchestra backing the band. They do um, all of Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence with the orchestra. They do all of Octavarium, the song Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence, and the song Octavarium. Both big, giant epics. Octavarium is 45 minutes. and I mean, Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence is 45 minutes. Octavarium is 25 minutes. They do both of those in their entirety with the, the orchestra backing. In addition, they did at least one song from every album since it was kind of this 20th anniversary show including um, uh, one really great song that I like a lot. I cannot remember the name of it right now. Um, uh, we'll get to it in a minute because I got it on another place here. Um, I like that CD a lot, or that DVD a lot. 2008 is also, it's not a single show, uh, Chaos in Motion. It's not a single show. It's uh, videos from different shows on the... Um, uh, systematic Chaos Tour. <coughs> uh, not as high quality video, um, but it's a good collection of songs. Live at Luna Park is the band's first DVD without Mike Portnoy. And then the Distant Memories Live in London in 2020. They revisited Scenes from Memory, Scenes from Memory and played it in its entirety there. I'm not as big a fan as those shows. Frankly, it's hard to think of this because Mike Portnoy is a drummer, but he is in many ways a, a natural frontman. He's just magnetic on stage, and without him, the band is simply not as interesting to me. All right, if we layer in um, scores from Progressive Archives and Metal Music Archives, we can see that they think that the DVDs are largely high quality as well. You can see all these are right around 80. Um, and like myself, uh, at least the metal music crowd is not as big a fan of the, the non-Portnoy DVDs. Progressive Archives doesn't have a review of Distant Memories for whatever reason, I don't know. So, in total, uh, like I said earlier, most bands, once you get past the studio content, you don't really need to know much more, but the DVD content is really, really uh, a significant part of the Dream Theater catalog to me. And I'm really grateful that we have such a huge library of really high quality live DVD music from them. All right, let's go look at the live albums, which in many ways mimic what we just looked at, meaning these are simply recorded versions, you know, these audio versions of what the live DVDs are. Uh, all those marked in blue ha are essentially uh, audio versions of the DVDs that we looked at. There are a few others. Live at the Marquee was their very first live release recorded in, I believe, England in, on their first tour over there. Uh, a Change of Seasons I mentioned earlier I, when I reviewed the albums, that that's a combination of one long studio song, A Change of Seasons, and then four cover songs that were recorded live. All those covers are really great. They really are. They're fun to listen to if you enjoy all the bands that they cover there, which include Yes, and Iron Maiden, and Deep Purple, and Queen, and Pink Floyd, and Led Zeppelin, you know, that, that type of stuff. <clears throat> and then Once in a Lifetime, remember we had five years in a lifetime as a video, that Once in a Lifetime is distinct and separate from that. The songs are all completely different. But this is a double live CD, and it's outstanding in my opinion. I really, really like that. They have a lot of good versions of songs on, on that version. All right, so the last thing I want to cover is that we've talked about their studio albums, we've talked about the live DVD releases, and we've talked about the live audio releases. But in addition to all that, Dream Theater has a lot of kind of what I would call bonus material. These are um, discs that say were added to, to, to deluxe editions of their CDs or that were released via Yitzy Jam um, as official bootlegs. And there's really quite a lot of it. And some of it is good, and some of it's not so good. <clears throat> the one that I'll say, the, the ones that I like a lot is um, this one, the changing, uh, cleaning out the closet from 1999 fan club. So if you were a fan club in 1999, you, you, if you were a member of the fan club, back then you would get a fan club CD every year. This is easily the best of those fan club CDs. Um, one of the things that makes it really good is um, 
the Falling Into Infinity CD was originally uh, envisioned as a double CD, and then the record company insisted that it not be. So a lot of the songs that were supposed to have been on Falling Into Infinity are included on this release, including Raise the Knife, which is a 10-minute epic that I love and is the song that I mentioned earlier that was played at the score show uh, that was not on any of their studio releases. Um, we have here the, the making of Scenes from a Memory. On the 20th anniversary, or I think the 10th anniversary of Scenes from a Memory, they released the making of Scenes from a Memory. And this is notable for two things. One is they have a bunch of demos and, and songs in, you know, as they're being developed. And that's what makes up the first CD. And, and it's interesting, but not all that compelling. But the second one is really interesting because the version of Scenes from a Memory that found its way onto the CD that everybody bought back in 1999 was not the original version. The original version had been mixed and uh, edited differently. And it was about to go to the record plant for printing and Petrucci called up Mike Portnoy and said, I don't think that we got it right. And they went back and kind of agreed and, the, and they hired a different, uh, not editor, not producer, to, uh, I figured they hired a different guy to do the editing of the, of the album. And then they ended up choosing that revised version. This, what we have here, is the original version. And it doesn't differ significantly from from the the version that most people know, but it does differ a little bit. And um, it's really interesting to me to hear and listen to that. <clears throat> then we've got two complete shows that were recorded in 1993 and 1998, New York and Los Angeles. The recordings are not super great. These are not ideal. And then after that, we have, uh, in addition to the Dark Side of the Moon live video, there is a CD that comes with it with lots of covers of Pink Floyd songs, some better than the other. Here's the, the Number of the Beast. Remember I told you that they would cover different albums. They released their version of the Number of the Beast. Listening to Jordan Ruta's keyboards play some of the guitar parts it makes me wish they were guitars. Why? Probably my favorite, other than the, the making of Scenes from a Memory, is this Black Clouds and Silver Lining. Remember, that's the album that I really did not like. Uh, I gave it, I think, a 58 or 49. Um, did not like the arrangement, but that came with the deluxe edition that comes with two bonus discs. One is an instrumental version of the album, um, and some of those are actually better than the versions that have lyrics, which is really an indictment on the versions that have lyrics, that the instrumental versions are better. But included on that is, I believe, an eight song CD of covers. And they do all these covers really well. They have things like To Tame a Land by um, Iron Maiden. They do Odyssey by, I think, the Dixie Drags. Uh, let me think. Um, they do uh, Diary of a Madman by Ozzy. They do Gates of uh, Cemetery Gates by Pantera. Um, a lot of really cool songs, and they do them well. Uh, there's a Yes song on there. Um, Oh, I can't remember it. It's a long song. It's like a 10 minute song from early in their career. Um, and then Black Clouds and Silver Lining, uh, the instrumental mix. Okay, so that's that's the other CD that was part of this. And you can see what I think about that. But if you add all that stuff up, it's a fairly substantial library of kind of bonus material. And it's not as high quality as the regular stuff. There's a reason it's, it wasn't released primarily. But within that, there's quite a bit of good music. All right, that is it. I have gone through all of my Dream Theater catalog and given my opinions on them. I hope you enjoyed it. I think this, uh, in total, it's got to be almost an hour and 20 minutes of video. So if anybody ever makes it through this entire thing, kudos to you. I appreciate it. I hope you hit the like button or uh, subscribe to hear more content from the Rock and Roll Soapbox. I'll see you next time.